So when we're talking about intelligence, it's not enough to operationalize it. Psychologists are interested in measuring it. Uh, to measure intelligence, a very famous psychological test was created. Alfred Binet created the Binet Intelligence Scales. And he was essentially trying to find a way to quantify and measure intelligence. So he did this by grouping students by ages. He also grouped concepts that kids should be able to successfully understand tasks they should be able to perform by those specific ages. So if you have a thousand five-year-olds, he could simply items that these five-year-olds should be able to accomplish. Then uh, he simply would compare those items to other other five-year-olds. A five-year-old gets the five-year-old items right. That five-year-old is given a mental age of five. So five divided into five times a hundred um, would equal a hundred, right? Five divided into five is one times a hundred. Uh, and that way we can really see difference. We can That way we can compare. Um, if you have a 10-year-old who is getting all the 10-year-old items correct, he's getting all the 11th and 12th and 13-year-old items correct. Even, it, let's say he tops out at 15. So we have a 10-year-old with a mental age of 15. We would divide 10 into 15, uh, and then we would get we would get uh, five, basically 1.5. You multiply 1.5 times 100, you get 150. So an IQ of 150 would be significantly intelligent. If, on the other hand, you had a 10-year-old who was very delayed, he was not getting 10-year-old items correct, he wasn't even getting 9 or 8 or 7 or 6-year-old items correct. So let's say he, he tops out at a mental age of 5, 10 divided into 5 is, is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 times 100 is 50. Uh, so an IQ of 50 would be significantly under average, significantly delayed. And so here the IQ test was born, the intelligence quotient uh, being a formula for quantifying giftedness or, or delay. The Binet Intelligence Scales then were created and standardized. They were then adapted and adopted by researchers at Stanford University. So this gave way to the Stanford Binet IQ test. So if you look at this chart, you can see the type of item. And on the very left of this, you see the age group. So a two-year-old, this would be a mental age of two, a two-year-old ought to be able to find a board with three differently shaped holes and classify these blocks, right, short, medium, tall, right, square, triangle, circle, circle, and blue, yellow, red. Not only classifying these three different concepts, uh, but also placing them in the right box, having the right motor coordination to do this. Stanford Binet has a four-year-old mental age. You can see the example of this with a block bridge. So the person who's administering the Stanford Binet could simply uh, show children this and show children the, the block bridge. And a four-year-old ought to be able to replicate this. Uh, a seven-year-old should be able to understand similarities. So in what ways are a ship and a car alike? So children underneath, uh, below age seven, can't really get this abstraction. They would say, uh, "My, uh, a four-year-old child would ask, be asked this question. They would say, a car is not like a ship. Ships go on water. Cars go on the road. They think very concretely. So when children get to this mental age of seven, they should be able to say, well, a, a car and a ship are both vehicles. 
Um, they can both have motors. They both can carry people. If you get to a mental age of nine on the Stanford Binet, this is digit reversal, and this gets more complex. So here a child can repeat four digits backwards, and we can do digit reversal for uh, longer numbers, and then it becomes more complicated. Uh, the average adult vocabulary, so the average adult mental age, uh, we could see a child is very advanced that they can define 20 words from a list. Uh, so from the Wexler Intelligence Scale, this was um, another uh, flagship IQ test that you, you will always study in cognitive psychology and the study of intelligence. I'm just going to look at some classifications here on the left. You have the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, and you also have the WISC, the Wechsler Intelligence Scales for Children. Uh, so the, the WACE, the so Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scales, um, they have these verbal scale on the left, and they also have a per performance scale. So if you have someone who's an adult, yet they are developmentally delayed and they can't read, then we can still measure their IQ. So this is important for uh, working with populations that, that can't read. We still would want to measure their intelligence. And we can't assume just because someone can't read that they're not intelligent uh, because um, they, they still might be able to gain lots of information and maybe uh, have tremendous giftedness. So in the information scale, right, uh, what is steam made of? What is pepper made of? Uh, who wrote Tom Sawyer? Those are some examples. Comprehension. Why is copper often used in electrical wire? It is uh, it's a good conductor. You know what? What is the actual purpose of keeping money in a bank? Right, accumulating interest. Um, there's some some security to this. Uh, arithmetic. Um, here you have some word problems. Uh, similarities. Here you have uh, different cognitive tasks, uh, vocab vocabulary. We move to the performance scale. I find these tests very interesting. In the uh, picture arrangement, a story is told in three or more cartoon panels and placed in the incorrect order. And you must put them together to tell a story. And this is a certain unique type of intelligence. If a, if a person has a very high perform, performance scale, yet their, their verbal, verbal scale is low, then it may indicate a learning disability and vice versa. Um, block design. After looking at a pattern or design, try to arrange the small cubes in the same pattern. Uh, and then you look at digit symbol. This is learning a different symbol for each number and then filling in the blanks under the number for the correct symbol. This is a time test. It's very complicated. Unlike the Stanford, the Wechsler is a one-to-one -one test administration. So one test administrator uh, giving the test and one uh, test taker. So when we look at test construction, uh, some, some words come to mind. Reliability and validity. So validity is the degree to which the test measures what it is supposed to measure. Reliability is the tendency to yield the same results given the same conditions. If a test is unreliable and invalid, meaning it's not measuring intelligence and it's not even yielding the same results. If a test is reliable but invalid, it's getting consistent results, but it's not measuring intelligence. And then finally, uh, the best measurement of a test being accurate, accurately, consistently measuring IQ is very reliable, is very valid. One example of a test that was very reliable but invalid, was not measuring IQ, although it claimed to be, was the Al Army Alpha. And shortly uh, during World War I, there was a very quick mobilization, and the military wanted a, a way of separating those recruits who would be sent to basic training for uh, 
uh, for frontline service and those who were sent to officer training school. If someone was sent to an officer training school, what would be the best determining factor but intelligence? So a test was created uh, and it had questions that weren't related to intelligence and really weren't related to a person's intellectual ability. Uh, so one, one question was very popular to discuss in, in a test in a class like this was their knowledge of golf. So what would be a better score in golf, 100 or 300? You could also ask the same similar question, what would be a better score in bowling, 100 or 300? You probably know that in golf, the lower score is better, so 100 would be a much better score than 300. But in bowling, the higher score is better. 300 would be better than 100. Now, what does this have to do with the military? Absolutely nothing. But yet the, the item consistently separated individuals, and if you didn't know about golf and bowling today, you retook the test six months from now, you still wouldn't know. So the Army in Alpha was consistently measuring something, but it wasn't intelligence. So what was it? Well, during the time of the Army Alpha, the only people that knew anything about golf and bowling were, were wealthy men. So sons of bankers and lawyers and politicians that grew up playing golf and grew up bowling. Uh, so the Army Alpha and the Army Beta were not really discriminating between the intelligent and the, the very intelligent and, and less intelligent. It was discriminating against uh, the wealthy and the middle working class. So an IQ test must actually be measuring intelligence and not cultural knowledge. And so as we are creating a test, we do this by standardizing the test. And the, st the test is standardized based on the population. So the population should be taken from a representative sample. We can't measure the intelligence of everyone in the United States, uh, so we have to simply get a sample. And in standardizing a test, we are creating norms. We want to make sure that the items are actually uh, good items, that they really measure what we're trying to measure. And we also want to make sure that the statistical breakdown of the pop of the uh, the sample is repre representative of the population. So now IQ or intelligence quotient is not used like it used to be. Uh, we now use a deviation IQ. So the Wechsler IQ score is really based on. Uh, how far one deviates from average. It's really a statistical IQ. So, for instance, if someone scores 100 on the Wechsler IQ, uh, then we would see that they score exactly 50% greater than half the population. They would score less than 50% of the other half of the population. So I ask my students on a test, what percentage of the population scores 100 or better? The answer would be 50. Um, if I say uh, a standard deviation, what I'm talking about is 15 IQ points on the Wechsler. A standard deviation would be uh, sort of like, uh, you know, like an, like an inch. An inch is an inch is made up of several different centimeters. Uh, if you look at um, one ruler and you compare it to another ruler, right, that the length of a centimeter shouldn't deviate. It's standardized. Uh, an inch is made up of the same number of centimeters. And it's the same thing with IQ because a standard deviation is made up of uh, 15 IQ points. And every different segment of 15 IQ points that I go, I will find greater rarity. Right? I'll find fewer people with that level of intelligence. So uh, if you look at this chart, a mean IQ is 100. If 
we take the average IQ, if we gave everyone in the United States a Wechsler test, um, we should ha still have an average IQ of 50. That 100 is dead center of intelligence in the population. Every 15 IQ points, up or down, I'm getting a, a greater uh, collection of people. All right, and, and, and as we get to the end, as we of this bell-shaped curve, if we get to the edges, then we're getting to those who are outliers, all right? Statistical outliers. They lie out away from average. Okay, so let's take one standard deviation to the right of average, and we're getting uh, closer to gifted, all right? A population that we call gifted would be IQ scores of about 120. A person who scores an IQ of 120 is gifted, um, and they're making up um, maybe the, like the top 84th percentile. So what you do is you, you add, um, let's say if I'm going to go one standard deviation above and below, uh, that's 68% of the population. That's what we call within normal limits. All right, when we start moving beyond that, then that's when we start getting greater rarity, right? Um, so a person who scores 70 on an IQ test they are uh, closer to mental retardation or delayed, right? Um, they would make up about 2% two, two of the population. A person who scores 130, they, that is giftedness, all right? So an IQ of 130 is clearly gifted, and they would make up about 98% of the population. If we go further out to the edges, if I were to ask you statistically, right, what does a person with an IQ of 150, an IQ of 100, and, and excuse me, what does an IQ of 150 and 50 have in common, right? You would say they are both outliers. They are both 0.1% of the population. Um, so genius would be an IQ of 145. So IQ of 150 would be super genius. Um, so the Wechsler IQ score can help us in figuring out where a person falls, especially if they are unique. We're really asking with the deviation IQ, how unique are you? So um, if you add up these percentage points, it gives us inform uh, information, like a percentile rank is the percentage of people below you. So if I if I scored 130 on an IQ test, so basically 90, 98% of the population is scoring less than me. I'm at 98 percentile. If I score 145, then I'm at the 99 uh, percentile rank, right? Um, if I have an IQ of 70, then I'm at the 2 percentile, all right? Um, so that gives you some understanding of, of what we're doing with a deviation IQ. When creating an IQ test, psychologists have to be careful to watch out for cultural bias, uh, like the Army Alpha, not asking questions about uh, information that only a certain group of people would know. Uh, that would be a, a biased application. So Dove was a social psychologist in the 1970s who wanted to create a counterbalance general intelligence test. So he loaded into the test items that only African Americans would know at the time. So this gave African Americans uh, something of an advantage based on their cultural knowledge. And this was published really not as an IQ test to measure intelligence to be used, but really sort of as, a, as something to use for science and for testing. Um, again, mental retardation requires an IQ of 70 and skill deficits in two areas. So with, with that, we will conclude and
I look forward to hearing your posts on the discussion board to see what you think about intelligence, uh, intelligence testing, and uh, always have some lively discussion on this. All right. Uh, so take care and uh, look forward to reading your work online.